right. Hey everybody. All right. Let me do a little intro here. <laughs> so welcome to my first uh, YouTube stream. This is going to be fun. We've never done this before, so it might be a little clunky, but uh, uh, hopefully um, everything will work out. I'm going to jump over here and get to my Photoshop. Um, so, you know, we're going to do this every Thursday. Oh, what is that? <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I'm going to mute that. Um, I think it was your, I think it was your YouTube thing. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So, um, anyway, once again, we're, we're going clunky, but, uh, so we're going to do this every Thursday on YouTube, one o'clock Eastern time, this time right now. And, uh, and then remember every Tuesday, we're going to be doing it on my Facebook page as well. So twice a week, I'm going to be drawing live and we're going to be doing any number of things. I might be drawing, painting, animating, who knows? So we'll just do whatever I feel like doing. And so the other day I was doing some animation for uh, my Facebook page. And today uh, we've got a, a bit of a limited time. I've got to do a Skype with a college later on. And so I've got about an hour, hour and 15 minutes to work with you guys. And so I thought I would just draw. I get a lot of questions. You know, uh, you know, I was with Disney for 21 years and as an animator and a, and a director. But part of my job as an animator was I had to be a character designer. I designed Raja the Tiger and Nala the Lion from The Lion King, among other characters. And so um, a lot of people ask me about my animal. I specialize in animals. And so they ask me about my how do I approach my animal character design. So I just thought it might be fun just to sit down and do some really quick sketching with uh, some some animals. So I picked an elephant. I love elephants. I love to draw them. And I'm going to have on my screen over here, which you won't be able to see, but I'll pull them over, uh, some photos. These are photographs that I shot uh, when I was in Africa a few years ago. Let me do this. There we go. Um, and so I just grabbed several photos and I like to keep them for reference, even though, yes, I know elephant anatomy and I know this and that. I like I still like to have it. I like to have it. At, maybe it's a crutch. Uh, it's something just to refer to. I like to see where I can push and pull and caricature and that sort of thing. So I'm going to keep these over on the other side over here while I draw. And um, and I'm just going to this one. I think this one kind of stands out to me. I like this pose. And I think I'm going to I'm going to use this as my inspiration to let me go ahead and blow that up so you can see it as my inspiration uh, to get some character. Um, this is a big matriarch. She was the leader of the herd. Um, matter of fact, uh, we got a little too close to the herd and she got in front of us and flashed those tusks right at us. So um, she was awesome. She was very protective. So I want to do a little caricature of her. So I'm going to move her over over to the other side. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and start drawing. Um, like I said, we got a little limited amount of time, so I want to just jump in. Oh, also, I just want to mention today I've got my son, Dustin Blaze. Uh, he's going to be fielding questions for me because I can't read them while I'm drawing. Can you say hello, Dustin? Hey, guys. And I've got my partner, Nick Birch, in Sarasota, Florida. And he's also going to be typing and answering questions for everybody. So go ahead and ask questions. I'm going to draw and, uh, and just talk about what I think about. So let's just dive in. So the first thing I, I do is I just look at the general shape. And a lot of times I just like to start with a head. And so on this elephant, I'm looking at, you know, that head is basically, it's basically a triangle, right? So I want to start with that basic shape. But I also want to caricature. So I want to exaggerate. So one of the things, you know, in real elephants, that eye is kind of set in the middle. Well, in here, I want to bring that eye up. I want to give her a little attitude. Maybe I'll make it a him. Who knows? We'll see. But I'll just give her a little, give him a little attitude. Him, her, I'm not sure yet. And I want to look, I'm looking down. I want to see those tusks. And I want to really exaggerate kind of what's happening right here. And as I, as I do this, as I find the character, maybe she's looking at us like she doesn't want us there. You know, they've got these big protruding cheekbones. Yeah, that's the other thing, too. I try to stay, even though if I'm, I might be caricaturing and doing something cartoony, I try to stay true to the anatomy. I try to caricature the anatomy as well. That helps make that character feel real. 
I'm going to go ahead and resize because like I said, I like to start big and then I just start resizing and working, working towards a full body. The other thing too is I like to think in terms of straights and curves. So like here's a perfect example. I want this trunk to be hanging down and then I'll get a nice curve against it like so. But see, when I was talking about that eye being kind of in the middle on a real elephant, here I've pulled it up so I get a nice small cranium and I get a nice big area down here. And it creates a nice contrast and it creates a pleasing design in my mind. Now let's get that tusk in. One of the things I know about elephants is that the tusk, if you draw a line up, goes right up towards that eye. So I want to make sure that that stays consistent. And she's got some beautiful tusks. I'm just going to pull that way out and just exaggerate it even more so that they're even bigger. I just go way out and I want to think about the tusk on the other side coming down. Maybe it crosses over just like this. And then you notice too that I'm staying super loose. I always try to stay super duper loose. So let's pull this up here because I want to I want to sketch that body in. So I've got a head. Notice I got nice simple shapes. I've got a nice head that I like. Let's go ahead and do the body. And I want to do it at three quarter like I was showing you on that one. And uh, so I'm going to first bring the ear up because the ear is so prominent, obviously, on elephants. Got a question. Sure. Uh, is there any visible differences to take note of between male and female African elephants? Yes. One is size, obviously. A big difference that you can tell, obviously, because African elephants both grow, male and females both grow tusks. Um, but the, the biggest difference that you can see other than their, their male and female parts are, uh, is the head. A female elephant will tend to have a more squared off, like if you looked at her in profile, she'd have a head like this. Here's the tusk coming down and the, and the trunk like that. And you'd have this square right there. That's very female. A male will tend to be much bigger, first of all, and they have these big sloping heads and they're just massive, much, much bigger than a female. Males can be half again as big as a female. So they can be really, really huge. And so you can see, I'm kind of thinking about this guy as a male and you can see I'm kind of sloping his head back like so. And they tend to be really wide, you know, in the face. I'm gonna actually pull this that way, there we go. So let's, I'm going to, and I want, you know, obviously elephants are, are, you know, loose skinned, big and frumpy. So let's, I'm going to go ahead and get that, that feel in here. One of the things about elephants is that their rib cages are kind of high and everything else just kind of hangs. And so I want to get, first of all, there's the crest of the back of the spine right there coming up. And we're going to show the shoulder blades back in there. Maybe a little bit of the ears over here. But I want to hang this way down and I want to get him, I want to make him feel this neck is going to come in. Notice how loose I'm being. I don't worry about making a pretty drawing yet. I want to get form, anatomy. I'm going to go really tall with him. I might resize that head. I want to go really kind of baggy. I want everything to feel like it's kind of hanging down like so. And then we come out here We move this up a little bit. So this is, you know, and a lot of times I'll come in and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do a lot of different poses. This, because I have such a, sh a limited time, I'm just going to, and I've drawn so many elephants, I'm just going to go fairly quickly and just do the one pose. That feels pretty good. You know, their, their back feet are kind of like this and the front feet tend to be kind of even like this. Yes. How do you move your arm and wrist to make such live curves? Like live curves? You know what? It's just over time. I, I really, I try to draw from the shoulder and, um, and it gives me the ability. I've, you know, I don't like to, I don't like to do this. I don't draw with my fingers. I draw with my, my wrist and my arm and my shoulder. And it gives me more fluid um, 
It gives me more fluid line. I'm gonna, I wanna really exaggerate this, so I wanna bring that trunk way down. Get a nice, that feels really cool to me. And remember, <clears throat> when you're doing character characters, it's all about caricature. It's all about exaggeration. And I want this to feel exaggerated. I want him to feel, oh man, I don't like that. I want, to, I want this to come in here. There we go. When there. does a piece of artwork become a fine art piece? Well, you know what? I think any art is fine art. It's, uh, it's you know, there's, that's an ongoing debate. You know, il illustration is basically when you're getting paid for it. <laughs> but you get paid for fine art as well out of the gallery. But a lot of time it's for print or, or that sort of thing. But I think, you know, even illustration work is fine art. You know, it's, it's. It's, I think it's all philosophical. Whatever you hang on your wall, you can call it fine art. But, you know, I've, I've hanged advertising art on my wall. So, so here. So now I've, I've basically got something really quick. And it's, I like the attitude. There's, I'm going to push, I want to push this a little bit more. Maybe what I'll do is, the great thing about Photoshop is I can grab sections and... I can move them around. So I'm going to just move this leg. Maybe I move this leg this way a little bit. I want to get, I want it to feel like he's, you know, like a little bit of a, a column there. So here we go. And that, that comes out. Do you have any tips for drawing big cats like lions and tigers? Yeah. Um, the best tip I can give you is learn the anatomy. And, that's, and that goes for any animal. So, I mean, there's nothing I can say right now that's going to give you a magic bullet on how to draw um, big cats. Uh, but the way I learned is I, I went out and I studied them. I went to the zoos. I, you know, I know not everyone can do this, but I went to Africa. Um, I've, I, go, I, I try to exhaust every avenue I can to find the resource, to get the resources to learn my subject matter. That's the that's the biggest thing. When we made Lion King uh, at Disney, you know, back in the early 90s, we brought lions into the studio and we sat there and we drew them from life. Um, uh, you know, part of the crew was in Florida. I was in Florida. So we went to the Miami Metro Zoo. We stayed there for three days and we went backstage and we drew the, uh, uh, the animals there. So there was, um, you know, there's, it's just, a, it's a lot of study. And that's, that's basically, all you can do you have to study you got to do the the homework and learn that anatomy and you know I've, I've studied the anatomy of elephants you can see I'm, I'm drawing quickly here even though I'm looking at reference I'm drawing I'm off of what I already know and then if you do that if you draw off of what you know already then you can exaggerate it you know what the base is and then you can go off and you can push and pull and have some fun with it so here I've got kind of a messy scribbly drawing the other thing I'll do is I'll I'll, uh, I'll flop it. I want to see what it looks like backwards. And here, I, I want to pull this back even more. Like this leg is coming, getting pulled back. Make him feel a little thin. I want a nice silhouette. So I want to open up this gap right here. Make that feel like this foot's coming forward. We're going to have ultimately wrinkles and everything. Let's give him some big toes. Maybe a push the size of those feet a little bit more. But now, the hips come way out here, and everything feels, maybe we bring the other foot back there. So when you start drawing, do you... That feels good. Do you start with a low resolution canvas in Photoshop? No, I don't. Matter of fact, sorry, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm, uh, right now I'm working on 16 inches by 20 inches at 300 DPI. That's... 90% of everything that I do, unless it's a special uh, uh, proportion, a special si uh, you know, size that I need to do, I do everything 16 by 20. It's just a personal preference of mine. Um, and, uh, and I do it at 300 D DPI. You could blow that up to the size of a wall and it'll be fine. So, um, you know, it's just I have my computers fast enough that it can handle it. So here I'm going to re reverse it back. So now I've got something that I like, you know, it's kind of coming together. Maybe the other ear we can see over there. And you notice we got nice, simple shapes. If, we, if you looked at that silhouette, it's, 
it's pretty clear and it's nice and simple. Now what I like to do is I'm going to knock that opacity down and I like to keep the rough drawing. It, it adds life to the final drawing but what I'm going to do is I'm going to get in here now and I'm going to start refining that drawing. I'm going to knock the size of my brush down. This brush I'm using by the way, the sketching brush, is one of my I, I make my own brushes and this is a custom little sketch brush that I made. I have it on my website at creatureartteacher.com which is my website and uh, there, it's, I, I have a, a bunch of Photoshop brushes that I sell there and this is in my original pack. It's number seven. I use it all the time for everything. But what I do is I can come in here and I really, I want to see, I want to be really, really faithful to how those wrinkles come off the head. But you can see I'm, I'm being kind of angular and I want to, I want to create something interesting. One of the other things too about African elephants is, you know, in the skull, there's a big hollow up in the side. So I want to make sure that that gets indicated. I want to be, like I said, really truthful to the anatomy. Pulling this down, you can see a little bit of the brow on the other side. And he's, he's a mean guy. Let me see here. I'm going to blow one of these up just so I can see the wrinkle pattern a little better. There we go. Because I want to make sure I caricature it just right. How can one learn to draw from shoulder if they have made a habit with drawing with fingers? <laughs> you got to break the habit. That's the only thing I can tell you is, is just if every time you catch yourself doing it, you know, you know, just don't try not to do this. And obviously if you're drawing on a piece of paper like that, then you have to draw small. But if, you know, I have, I'm drawing today, I'm drawing on a, a Wacom Cintiq. 27 QHD so it's a 27 inch screen I've got a big screen that I'm drawing on and I do that purposely so I can you know draw like that and I realize not everybody can if you're drawing digitally not everybody has that so you know if you're drawing on an iPad or something like that you do have to kind of tighten up a little bit but if you're drawing on paper you know draw big you know try get some big newsprint and charcoal and try just kind of going nuts don't worry about you know if that drawing's pretty or not and, uh, so once again, I want to make sure I get these cheekbones and that's such a that's such a, uh, a major part of an elephant's anatomy. The other thing too, especially on males, and maybe this guy's got it, um, this right here, this is called the temporal gland. Um, and both males and females have it, but males, it really, it's a big st stinky gland that kind of oozes and it's very iconic on elephants. When they go into must, meaning when they, you know, when they want to start, they get really aggressive, and they want to find a female and they want to make baby elephants. So, that's a, a really distinctive marking on on elephants here. There we go. Actually, I'm going to pull that. I want to push that even more. I get some of those wrinkles in there. There we go. I'm looking at the reference on the other side. You can see, even though. I'm, I'm, I want to go tighter. I'm still, I don't want to get, I don't want to tighten up so much that it, it kills the drawing. So I still try to stay spontaneous with my, uh, with my line work. There we go. Any advice on getting out of art block? You know, yeah. And it's, yeah, I don't get art box block so much. I get that question a lot. Um, the question is, you know, any advice on getting out of art block? The best thing you can do is just sit there and draw. Just draw. Just draw anything. Look across the room and draw. And eventually you'll just you'll start breaking out of it. Um, I um I don't really have a problem with that anymore. But you know, there are times when it's it's it doesn't come as easily. And I'll just sit down and I'll just start drawing and and eventually it, it eases up. So I want to caricature some of these ridges on the nose and they all kind of come down and they feed right into that skin that goes over the tusk. I'm going to pull that down just a little bit. There we go. There we go. Just like so. We got any more questions out there? Uh, there we the go. drawings always end up being different depending on which angle or distance you're looking at them. Is it a problem of perspective in my drawings? 
how can you practice to fix it? Can you repeat that real quick? Are you still able to see it? Yeah, my drawings always end up being different depending on which angle or distance you're looking at them. Is it a problem of perspective in my drawings? I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but it could be perspective, yes. You know, a major part of getting a drawing right is making sure you get your perspective right. And uh, I think about perspective, not just, and I'm not just talking about drawing buildings and things that are mechanical, even if you're drawing char characters, you know, I want to make sure that my perspective, my ground plane on the elephant here, I want to make sure that that's all consistent. I want to make sure everything is sitting in space the way that it should. So you need to be a good um, kind of student of that. I'm just going to simplify this a little bit more. Be a good student of that and and uh, and work on it. Work on that perspective because it, it really is important. How many hours do you spend in a day for drawing? I draw every single, well, I shouldn't say I draw every day because there's times that I know I go off on do whatever. But when I'm working and I'm drawing, I draw normally eight hours a day. And, um, and I've been doing it, I'm 49 years old. I just turned 49 last weekend. So I'm an old dude that's been drawing for a long time. And if you do anything for a long time, you get better at it. So I've, I feel comfortable with the way I draw. A lot of people ask me, you know, how do you, how do you become a professional artist or an animator or whatever? And I tell them, you know, it's just like anything else. If, if you want to be a, you know, a good basketball player or soccer player or, or whatever, you just play a lot of that sport. And if you think of drawing and animation as a sport, you do a lot of it. And um, I, I get as excited about drawing and painting and creating art as I did when I was six years old. I'm still, I still get giddy about it. And so I don't have any problem um, being, uh, being inspired. I get inspired every day to draw. I just, I lay in bed thinking about what I'm going to create the next day, you know, with animation and painting and everything else. So um, you, you got to love it because it's a, it's a labor of love and you, you got to do it every single day. So you can see I'm starting to refine him down a little bit. I'm going to give him a little bit of a torn, torn ear. There we go. Um, stop. Stream went offline. Can you okay. click on the OBS real quick? Yep. It says stop Oh, stream. shit. What? Stop. Watch your mouth. It, we're offline. Draw flame. Draw frames. Okay, so what does that mean? We lagged out. Uh, just stop stream and then restart it. Okay, I think we're back. I think we're back. Uh, sorry, we uh, we went offline there. This is, you know, once again, we're working out the bug, so we'll see. We'll see if it. Uh, I'm gonna get everything set back up again so we can see. I'm gonna go ahead and click right there. So you can see Dustin. Oh, actually, let me move this over. There we go. Now we can see if we're um, if we're going. There. I think we're good. And then the other thing too, right in here that is on elephants is you get these lines that come down. You get these horizontal kind of ridges that come across the trunk. Then we get these lines that come down. Like so. That's very much a uh, an African elephant trait, and I'm and I'm simplifying it and caricaturing it right now. How are we doing, Dustin? It's showing that we're streaming. Everyone can hear us. Good. That's but, good. But it's not showing a picture. All right. Can you guys see me? Because I'm just going to keep drawing. There we go. We got this coming in here. Can you guys see me? Yeah, they, they can see you, but I don't know why I can't. All right. Well, maybe you just need to refresh it. But anyway, I'm going to keep drawing. Go. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. All right. So I'm, I'm basically, I'm just tying everything down right now. Tying down meaning, you know, to, to get to the 
kind of the more detailed drawing. And I want to keep the integrity of that, the energy of that first initial drawing. So you can see I'm, I'm, I'm still staying pretty loose. There we go. There we go. I want, and I want that neck to come right into here. And I'll, I'm going to feel all this loose skin. There we go. How we doing everybody? Hope everything's good. Every day is good if we're sitting and drawing, right? I'm going to pull this up a little bit. What is the best uh, tip to draw from imagination? How to, how to get uh, different but good ideas? Yeah, the, you know, the best tip for, to draw from animation or from imagination <laughs> is to uh, draw from life uh, initially. You know, so much of what we what we create that doesn't exist, so much of what we create from our head is still derivative of what we already know. And so the more you know, the more you can pull from that and create something that's that's created from your imagination. Like creature design, for instance. So much good creature design, the best creature design is based on biology that we already know. And then we take that biology and we kind of twist it up and create something new. Uh, a great person to look at for something like that is Terrell Whitlatch is her name. Um, she's a big idol of mine. She's such a great artist and she's one of the best character or creature designers I've ever seen. And, um, and that's one of the, but she's also got a degree in, in real biology and, and she applies it to her design. And so, um, you know, she designed characters for Star Wars and, and other films like that. And, and it's all based on what she knows about reality. So that's a big part of that. There, I think I've got that foot in there. I like the size of that foot. That feels good. So you can see where, you know, we kind of started with nothing and now we've kind of got this fun elephant. And then if, the thing about African elephants too, if you look at the tip of their trunk, they've got two fingers on the tip of their trunk. Asian elephants have one finger. Just a little piece of useless trivia. <laughs> there we go. You got any more questions? Uh, what is the right way to represent light on the sketch? Well, I'm actually going to get to that next. So I'm going to finish uh, as far as, you know, the question was, what's the right way to represent light on the sketch? The first thing I do, this is my process when I creating something is I, I get this rough drawing in, I get the refined drawing in, let's get that spine, that ridge and the spinal column out there. And then I, uh, I do the refined drawing like I'm doing now. And then I start laying in color and I'm going to do that next. We've got, we've still got over half an hour, so we'll have plenty of time because I'm almost done with the sketch. Get some of those lines coming in there. There we go. There's Do you me. recommend any reading materials to help improve one's understanding of anatomy? Well, it depends on what anatomy that you're looking for. If you're talking about human anatomy, there's a huge amount of information out there on the internet. Um, uh, Samantha Youssef has just put out a great book on figure drawing. So I, I recommend looking up her book. I'm trying to remember the name of the book. It's escaping me right now. But her name is Samantha Youssef. So if you look up her name, the book will come up. Um, so there, there's just, there's an incredibly huge amount of, of information for human anatomy, animal anatomy. Look up Terrell Whitlatch. She's, you know, she's fantastic. Um, and then just you know, for me, one of my biggest sources is, is the internet. You know, anything you can think of, any question you can come up with, you can have answered. So do that as well. So I'm just gonna, I'm just finishing up this. I wanna get that other foot in there. There we go, it's a little shading back there. There we go. So now I've got this elephant. You can see we started rough. We started with that head. And I just started working my way, you know, wanting to keep shapes simple, wanting to keep silhouettes simple. Let's go ahead and rotate it. When did you decide to you start digital artworks and how long did it take you to become comfortable with it? Um, I, I really fought it. I fought 
you know, going digital for a long time. I, this is a little funky. That's okay. I fought going digital for a long time. You know, when we were doing, uh, I directed a film called Brother Bear, and I still did everything on paper for that film when I was doing design work for it in the, in the early days. But after that film came out, we started developing another film uh, for Disney. And it was going to be a, a computer animated film, but I was still drawing everything on paper and everybody else was working in Photoshop. So I thought, you know what, I better, I better jump over and figure it out. So uh, Disney was gracious enough to set me up with a, a Cintiq and Photoshop and, and, uh, and then everybody on the crew already knew Photoshop and there were some great, great artists. Um, one guy in particular, Andy Harkness, who just got done uh, art directing Moana. Um, he was art directing for us. And um, and so I would go into his office every day and say, hey man, can you show me how to do this or that? And so he really got me started and I owe a lot to him. He's an amazing artist. You should look him up. His name is Andy Harkness. He works at Walt Disney Feature Animation. He's an art director and he's brilliant. Um, and so I just, I learned a ton from him and, uh, and that just got me started working in and you know working digitally and one of the great things about photoshop that i discovered is that it's so robust you can do any one thing a thousand different ways and so i kind of took my traditional thinking and the way that i work traditionally and the way i layer color and all of that and i just brought it into photoshop and it works great so that's my it's my particular style and the way that i'm drawing now the way i'm working things up now this is my style. This is how I this is how I work in Photoshop. Some guys dive right in and start painting and just find the shapes. I like to start with a strong drawing first. Um, I like to yeah, I like control. I want to stay in control of everything the whole time. And for me, a strong drawing um, right off the bat is like having you know a good frame for your house. You can once you have the framing done, then you can hang the rest of the house on it and everything. There's no questions, you know, and, and there's there's no mystery. And so that's what I like to do here. So now we've got this elephant and I'm going to go ahead and enlarge him a little bit. I'm going to have him fill out just a little bit, just to be a little bigger. There we go. So we're getting some fun character there. I'm going to lighten up that lower drawing just a hair more. So it's not so potent. There we go. Now let's add some color. I want to go in and I'm, let's make him on the warm side. You know, one of the red, a redder elephant. I'm going to go more gray. And this is what I'm going to create now is local color. And actually, before I do that, because this is going to be a mid-tone gray, my background's mid-tone, I want them to pop a little bit better. So I'm going to go cool and a little darker. Maybe that's too dark. Maybe a little darker there. Let's just fill that background in. There we go. So now I'm going to go in, because I want him to pop. I want him to come off the page. Now I'm going to go warm. And, you know, orange and blue are complements, so I want it to, you know, to complement a little bit. I'm going to go a little bit more mid-tone and pretty, still warm, but pretty gray. And I'm going to go ahead and grab one of my other brushes here. There we go. And I'm just going to very quickly just start laying in some local color. Local color is a term we use. Um... Local color means it's the color of an object when it's not lit and it's not in shadow. It's just the color of an object. Because what I'm going to do next, after I lay in the local color, is then we're going to start adding lights and darks. We're going to add you know, lighter areas that are being hit by light, and we're going to add shadows. And so that is how, that's the process I've come up with. And um, for Photoshop. Um, when I'm painting more direct, more traditional, then I'm painting shadows and light areas and all that all at once. But the great thing about Photoshop is I can think about those things separately. And um, so that's what I'm doing now. So, and right now, the first thing I do is I just lay in one base coat. But local color will vary from, you know, each part of the elephant. So once I get it laid in, then I'm going to vary it up just a little bit. How often do you save, like, save your, your files and stuff? Oh, I save as often as I can, but I, and I'm notorious for not saving and forgetting and just getting into the drawing. So my, I think my computer automatically saves every 10 minutes, something like that. But thank you for reminding me. I'm going to go ahead and save. <laughs> and also, um, can you talk about how you go about the, 
thought process of taking something like a real life animal and simplifying it to match an animation style for a project? Well, that's that's kind of what I'm trying to do now. But when you when it's for a project, the first thing that I when I when I start on a new let's say let's go back to the early days when we were working on uh, let's say um, well Aladdin. I think Aladdin's a good example because Aladdin had a very very specific art direction style, and I was given the assignment to design and animate Raja the tiger, and so when I did that. Um, I had to learn tigers, obviously, but I also had to learn the the style of the film and make sure that that style is consistent in my character design. And so we were, the style was, there's a, a caricature artist, you might want to look him up, but his name is Al Hirschfeld. Al Hirschfeld. He's long since passed away, but he had a very distinct, very fluid style to his caricatures. And if you look at Al Hirschfeld's drawings and you look at the genie done by Eric Goldberg at Disney, it look, they look like they're done by the same person. That's how strongly uh, Eric was able to get that design sense into his, into his designs. Well, I was struggling. I, um, I had tigers down, but I, um, I really was struggling with getting, uh, getting that, design, that design sense into my work. And um, it was okay. It just it just wasn't it wasn't coming together until one day I was walking down the road, and um, someone had parked there was a, on the side of the road there was a Jaguar car, um, you know, sports car on the side parked, and I saw the uh, I saw the hood ornament, and if you look at the hood ornament on a Jaguar, um, it's very fluid, very flowy, <laughs> if that's a word. And I, it, all of a sudden, I got this inspiration, and I drew a picture of it. And then I went back to uh, my desk, and I applied kind of what I learned on just drawing that hood ornament, and I applied it to my Raja drawings. And all of a sudden, it started to come together. And within just a couple of days, I had the I had the design approved. So that was kind of cool. So I want to come in here, and I'm just going to erase back some of that underdrawing. So we can get this looking a little cleaner, but I want to keep some of the underdrawing on the on the face and head. So there's a, some initial under uh, local color, and I'm going to lock it. You can see the little checkerboard. I'm going to lock these pixels. So now I can't paint outside. I can only paint on top of these pixels, and I can come in and I can vary up some of the colors. So I'm going to do that now. So let's see here. I want to go a little cooler maybe, and I'm going to grab that color. I'm going to go cooler and darker, maybe around the eyes. Have you ever been approached uh, for doing game art or animations? Um, a little bit, not not much. I, um, you know, my my specialty is feature animation, and so I've kind of stayed out of the the gaming world. Uh, I'm unfortunately I'm not I'm not much of a gamer. I never really have been. But I, uh, um, I just, you know, I, like I said, I kind of focused, I've focused on more feature animation type stuff. And that's my, that's my wheelhouse. That's where I'm, I'm happy. I don't do CG animation. I've never learned it. I want to get a little red around his eyes, just to maybe a little, eh, there we go. Um, and so I, uh, let's go a little pink with his the whites of his eyes. There we go, and we'll get we'll get dark pupil in there later, but I um, yeah. So I I I haven't really not that much no. So there we go. Did you work with uh, um, Did you work in the movie Tarzan? No, I did not work on Tarzan. I was working on another film at the time, and I'm trying to remember what it was. I can't remember, but my brother Travis Blaze, who is also uh, an animator. He worked on Tarzan along with many people at our, at our uh, studio at the time. I'm going to go a little redder, a little warmer around the feet because, you know, maybe they're, they get a little dustier. Now, the films I worked on, um, I worked on a short animated, the very first Disney film I worked on was a, a short cartoon 
with Roger Rabbit called Roller Coaster Rabbit, and it went out with the movie Dick Tracy. And uh, and then I worked on a feature film called The Rescuers Down Under, and um, and that was the first film that I ever animated on. I animated a little bit on Roller Coaster Rabbit, just a couple of shots, but I I did you know a fair amount of animation on. The rescuers down under. You can see I'm varying up the color a little bit. I want to get nice. Maybe they're a little redder on top because they're always throwing dirt on their back, you know. Um, and then from there, we went on and we worked on Beauty and the Beast. And uh, and I was one of the animators of the Beast under Glenn Keane, who is the supervisor. Glenn Keane's a wonderful animator. And um, and then uh, from there, we went on to Aladdin. I did Raja the Tiger. And then uh, after Aladdin, we went on to um, uh, Pocahontas. I think it was Pocahontas, or Lion King. And then Pocahontas. I did Nala in, in The Lion King. Then Pocahontas. And then we went on to uh, uh, Mul uh, Mulan. Yeah, Mulan. And then, <laughs> sorry, I'm drawing a blank here. And then, uh, and then after Mulan, I directed Brother Bear. Co-directed Brother Bear with my directing partner, uh, Bob Walker and Chuck Williams produced. And then we had, you know, we did the, all of that in Florida um, with an amazing group of artists and friends. And we just had a really good time making that film. What was it like to uh, work with Phil Collins? Uh, Phil, Collins Phil Collins is a workhorse. And um, uh, so he was constantly writing and uh, he was a pro. He was just an absolute pro. And, uh, you know, he was, like I said, he was writing a lot. And so he would call me at home with new lyrics and we'd go over the lyrics and, uh, or he'd call Chuck, our producer. And, and, uh, uh, it was, it was great. It was a lot of fun working with somebody of his caliber. And, uh, so it was, you know, it was humbling. It was nice. There we go. So I think I've got the local color laid in kind of nice. Normally, I'm a little bit faster. I'm not talking so much. And uh, we've got about, I don't know, about 30 minutes left. So I'm just going to, once I get this in, now it's time to start laying in some shadow and uh, light uh, highlights. So I'm going to go ahead and keep in mind, too, th this, is th this process I'm showing you, I, um, I use all the time. This is how I do every illustration, pretty much. Here's one that I did last week. Um, and done with the same process. I just, you know, it took me a lot longer, longer than I'm going to be able to sit with you guys. But it all starts with that rough drawing, refined drawing. And I just keep working it up, working it up, going back and forth with light, shadow, that sort of thing. But I'm going to, you know, I'm going to show you with the elephant. But this is, this is the end result of one that I did last week. Move that over. There we go. There. So... I'm going to create a layer on top. I'm going to set it to multiply. That's the blend mode right there. I'm going to set it to multiply. And I want to go cool with my shadows. And I'm going to kind of get a slightly lighter than mid-tone cool gray. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to imagine the light kind of coming down over my right shoulder. That's kind of my, my go-to. I actually got a good question here. Sure. Uh, how did you make this switch uh, from animator to director onto Brother Bear? Um, well, it was really hard. I um, I had had a crew. I was very interested in story. Um, I had done a lot of questioning of given a lot of notes and that sort of thing uh, with the executives and and it. it it was a process. It, 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 I had to prove myself. And so over time, um, it was offered to me to direct. And I, at first, I was really nervous because, quite frankly, every up, up until that point, a lot of the directors that start the films, had, that had started the films that I had worked on, end up not finishing the films. They end up getting fired. And, uh, and I was afraid of kind of taking that leap and then losing my job. You know, I was safe as an animator. I knew how to animate. And, um, but I knew that if I didn't at least try, I would always question, you know, what if. So I went ahead and decided to do it. 
And, um, but one of the things was, it's the hardest thing I ever did. I didn't know what I didn't know. And uh, I, uh, I really struggled at first. The biggest thing I struggled with was not so much the art, but the story. And story is the most important part of any, of any filmmaking process. You know, the, the thing I always talk about with people with story is that it's, the, it's really the only part of the process that can stand on its own. I can sit you down and I can tell you a story. And if it's good enough, I can make you laugh, cry. I can, your mind will fill in the visuals. But that, you know, I, I, if I can tell it well, then I can take you on a journey. Um, whereas, you know, you can look at the visuals and if there's no story there. They're just visuals. They don't mean anything. So it's so it's so important to you know, integral to the to the process. And uh, actually, I want to put that shadow down underneath. That light is from up above. So we're going to have a shadow of the tusk down here. Do you still uh, prefer working practical than digital? You know what? I, I've I've fallen in love so much with digital that it doesn't matter to me. I working digital to me is um, as second nature as drawing uh, with a pencil on a piece of paper. So to me, it doesn't really matter. Um, I actually tend to like drawing digitally just because it's so, I can just sit down, turn my computer on and bing, 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 bang. I can, I can, I got color, I got everything. And I don't have to pull out my paints and all that kind of stuff. So that part is kind of cool. Um, real quick, I just want to explain, because um, someone had asked about the lighting. I'm imagining, and this comes from observation throughout my life, I'm imagining where that light is. I'm thinking about this character, not as a flat drawing, but as a three-dimensional form. And so I wanna, I'm thinking about how that light is hitting on that form and where those shadows are gonna be cast. So if that light is up here, like the, the ridge of this skin going over the tusk is gonna cast a little shadow onto the tusk. You know, going underneath the cheekbone is gonna cast a shadow. If I blow this up, um, let's see, we're still, okay, good, we're still streaming. I'm going to knock this down. You know, we'll get some shadow under the ridge of the eye. We'll get shadows under the bags. And I'm going very loose because this is, this is just a little character piece. So I don't need to, I don't need to go super tight. And I can always tighten as I go. That's the other thing to think about. Stay loose in the beginning. Have some fun. Don't worry about getting in there and noodling right from the beginning you can always tighten as you go and uh and so that way it keeps your it keeps your work kind of fresh spontaneous and uh so you can see i'm just i'm just staying very very loose now i know there's ridges in the in the ear from observations that i've done with elephants so that's all in shadow right there and that ear is casting a shadow on the on the on the shoulder and down here we're gonna go into shadow maybe down here just a little bit and then it gets dark under here do you offer any Skype mentoring or plan to yeah right now I'm not doing any one-on-one -on -one mentoring uh, only because it's my schedule is so tight um, and I'm you know we're just we're I'm just spread too thin um, there, we are talking about some options down the road uh, where we do maybe some Skype mentoring on a bit on a uh, more of a not one on one, but maybe, you know, 30 or 40 people at a time uh, where it's kind of like I said, we're just kind of talking about it now. But right now I'm not, unfortunately, only because I just don't have the time. So now I want to with these shadows, I want to start adding in some wrinkles. There we go, and those come around. Have you had any experience on a on an anime style job, and what's your views on anime? I I like anime. I um I've never had any experience on an anime type job. Um, a lot of people get mad at me because when I look at uh, young people's portfolios that have only anime in them, I tell them to stop drawing anime and to try other other things. And that's my biggest piece of advice. Anime is great. But if you want to find your own style, if you want to grow as an artist, then you have to explore other styles. You just, you have to. And, um, and so my biggest piece of advice for folks that are doing that is to, you know, try doing other styles. You can always come back to anime. It's a perfectly viable, you know, style. But, 
you know, if you explore other styles, those styles will rub off on you and you'll be able to bring that back and maybe you create something new. Maybe you create the next style that, you know, the next craze, who knows? There we go. So now you can see I'm getting some shadows in there. I get a little shadow coming Ten across minutes, there. The yep, we got it. Actually, I'm going to go a little bit long. You can see we've got a nice, nice character going. I'm kind of digging him. So now I've got some shadows. And let's go ahead and I'm going to create a new layer. And now I'm going to the overlay mode. And I'm going to go warm. Maybe even the same color as the, of the, uh, the skin. Go a little bit brighter. Not super bright. Got any more questions? Um, I'm going to go in here and, and lighten that up. And the chat is going to just move so fast. <laughs> um, so now I'm thinking direct, where is that light hitting directly? And that's what I'm going to do here. What do you got, Dustin? How did I, how did you get a job at Disney? That's a good one. Yeah. Um, when I, uh, I went to college and I wanted to, I wanted to be an animal artist. I've always drawn animals. Uh, that's always been my passion. And so I initially wanted to be a wildlife artist and do prints and, you know, do fine art. And, um, uh, but my goals kind of changed and I decided I wanted, you know, when I got into illustration, I went to, first of all, I went to the Ringling College of Art in DeSoto, Florida. And I, uh. I wanted to be an illustrator. I went. I was enrolled in the illustration department. They had no animation department at the time, and now they're kind of, you know, they're known for their illustration and and animation, and also interior design. And um, but uh, I um, I wanted to be an illustrator. I wanted to work for National Geographic, and uh, and I had freelanced my way through school, and I didn't want to freelance anymore. I just wanted a nice, comfortable staff position as an illustrator and I found out that National Geographic doesn't do that. They freelance. So I was kind of disappointed and um, so I started looking around. I went to our, our job placement uh, folks in the, in the office at school and they told me that Disney was coming to interview. I had never thought about animation at all. I'd never had any aspirations of animating. Um, it was just nothing that ever crossed my mind. And, um, but I thought, Ooh, maybe background painter would be kind of cool. And so I thought maybe I would do that. So I put together a portfolio. This is in 1988 and, um, uh, of figure drawings and animal drawings. And luckily, you know, like I said, I love to draw animals. So I, I had, you know, my animal drawings were pretty good. My figure drawings were pretty good. You know, they weren't bad. And so I, um, I got in, I got an internship. And uh, so I, that summer I went out to California. Uh, they were just finishing up um, Oliver and Company. They were making the film Oliver and Company. And uh, I'm not gonna hit these ridges. That's something I forgot with the shadows, but that's okay. Um, so they were fin finishing up Oliver and Company, just starting The Little Mermaid. And luckily I got matched up with Glenn Keane as my mentor. He's the guy that took me under his wing and taught me how to animate and so Glenn's very inspiring and so he taught me he showed me the magic you know it was it's just the absolute magic that you can create with animation and so when I saw that I was hooked and then I knew that's what I wanted to do for a living and that was it that's you know I finished out my internship they liked my work they decided to hire me for um uh, along with several other people for the studio that was opening at MGM in Orlando. That studio opened uh, uh, in 1989. And so um, I went back to school, finished my last year of school, and that's where I started. And uh, that's that's how I started with Disney. And I was there for with, with the company for 21 years. Do you have any uh, advice on storytelling? Perhaps anything you picked up on your time working on Brother Bear? Yeah, the biggest thing about storytelling is, first of all, I'm, I'm a big proponent of structure. Know your story structure. There's a certain way that films are told. And a lot of people, when I say that, they think, oh, you're talking about a formula. I'm not talking about a formula. There's just, there's ways that our films are structured, our stories are structured, that 99% um, of the time, that 
if you are having problems down the road and you look at that structure and you can say, oh, I didn't do this or I didn't do that, um, then, you know, I'm a big proponent of that. The other thing, too, is know your theme, meaning what is your story about and wrap everything around that. The way thing I the way I always explain theme is, you know, think of think of the story as as your backyard and a big and your backyard goes into the forest and it just goes on and on and on. You can just you can tell anything. Think of it as this big area. Well, the theme is the fence. The theme is what kind of wraps everything in and kind of gives you the area to tell the story. That that's what, you know, everything is about that one statement, whatever that theme might be. You know, be true to yourself or, you know, whatever it might be. And then once you once you nail that theme, then you can build build the story around it. The other thing is, a third piece of advice is honesty. Make sure that whatever you're telling, you're telling it from an honest standpoint. And also get get out, especially if you're a young person, get out and live life because you're going to you're going to experience things that you can bring into your stories. Um, I've I've been all over the place. I've I've suffered and I've loved and I've lost and I've had adventures and all of that. And it all makes its way into the stories that I tell. But that honesty, that's the biggest one. Just make sure you're telling an honest story. I want to go back to the cool. There we go. I'm darkening up some of these shadows. There we go. So you can see it's, um, you know, it's, it's rough. And, you know, we're coming up on our time limit here. But uh, I think we're coming up with a nice, a decent illustration. Quick. This is really quick. Let's go ahead and hit some of that. There we go. Would you say there are any cons to doing digital artworks? Cons? Yeah. Oh, I, I don't think there's any cons. The only con I can see is that obviously you don't have a physical piece of art, um, you know, afterwards. But that just, you know, that depends on if that's important or not. You know, I'm, a, I'm still a big proponent of... Of fine art so if I you know I I like to paint a lot of times mainly just so I can have something physical in my hands um, but for me I, I actually love the the versatility of digital art I'm going to create a layer on top this is one of the last things I do and, and now I can go in with like some brighter highlights and I can come in here and I can start hitting some of these areas by the way, um, what Photoshop brushes are you using currently? Well, the one I'm using now is a brush that's part of my custom. Uh, I make my own brushes, and this is a brush that I, I'm not trying to mark it, but you asked. This is actually a brush that I sell uh, in my photo on my uh, website, creatureartteacher.com, and uh, it's my original custom brush set. And this is actually brush number seven. I sketch with this. 99.9% .9 of the time, all the time. I'm going to go ahead and hit some, some light areas. Now I'm thinking about, I just want to add some details. There we go. People keep telling me 2D animation is dead. What do you think? I don't think it's dead. And if you, if you go to Europe, it's definitely not dead. It might be taking a snooze right now in, uh, in the United States. Um, from a feature standpoint, but if you look at television, it's not dead. Um, so obviously you're talking about feature stuff and, uh, but you know what, I think it, it'll, it'll come back around. I think, you know, there's, there's several people out there that I know are developing some projects. Um, I'm doing my own, uh, short project right now. As a matter of fact, I can show you a little clip right here. This is, uh, I'm doing a little animated short called Snow Bear. The software that I'm using is TV Paint. Uh, and this is just a one little shot. This is about a, a polar bear that goes, he lives in the Arctic and he can't find a friend. There's nobody around and so he decides to make a snow bear. And it's just kind of what they go through as it's a real bear and a snow bear. So here they are laying in the snow one night. And uh, matter of fact, I'll show you, I can show you on my, uh, right here. I'll show you in the storyboards. So uh, I'm going to click on this. It's 2 o'clock, by the way. 
That's good, thank you. And so if I play this, this is just a little section. This is after they're having fun. And you can see a little bit of animation that I've done where, let me turn that up. And so they're licking in the snow. He sees a, he sees a, a shooting star and he gets excited and looks up. So I'm still doing as, as much 2D as I possibly can. Then there they are sliding down a hill. Um, so it's not dead. It's uh, pe people are doing shorts. People are doing, you know, planning features. Uh, let me go ahead and go back to here. Um, uh, but, you know, be, I don't know if it'll ever be mainstream again like it used to be in the 90s. But you know what? It's okay. I think uh, I kind of like, I like the new, the new mediums and all that. So I think it's, you know, it's, if the right project comes along and it's the right art direction and all that, it'll happen. It will happen. Now, do you ever uh, go warm with the color in your in the shadows? Oh, sure. You can go warm in the shadows and cool in the light. So it really just depends on the in the environment that you're trying to create. You know, the, everybody that says you know anybody that says shadows are always cool um, hasn't really looked around enough. So no, you can. It's all, it, 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 your color is all, it, it's all how it, your color relates to one another within the image itself. So just make sure you keep that in mind. So you can see I'm hitting just some real tasteful little highlights here and there. And actually on the trunk, I can go really bright. I mean on the tusk. I'll just create a nice bright sheen right there. There we go. Question. I know you don't uh, do one-on-one -on -one mentoring, but would you ever consider reviewing someone's portfolio, like if they sent it in an email? Yeah, that's another one. It's it, it's hard for me, only because I that request that you just requested, I get about oh, a couple hundred of those a week, and there's just no way I can do everybody. But um, that's another thing that we're talking about, is setting something up like that, something special on our website. So... You know, stay tuned because uh, we definitely want to do something. And uh, but anyway, I'm uh, I could sit here and noodle, but I do. You know, we're, we're kind of I'm going over a little bit. I've got a 2:30 uh, Skype session with a college in Pennsylvania that I'm really looking forward to. So I need to uh, kind of wrap this up. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? One last thing, as far as lighting goes, I like to do reflect light. So I'm going to go into the shadow, and let's go cool. Okay, we're back again. Sorry about that. So I'm just going to finish this up really quick. There we go. And uh, I just like, I love to show, I'm thinking about this light source maybe further back a little bit. I'm going to knock that opacity down so it's not so bright. And I can use it to help define some of the form, some of these wrinkles. You can see there. And I do this pretty loosely there we go maybe we get something coming down this will be interesting coming down the side of the trunk there like that so I'll come through and I'll hit other you know alternative lights lighting situations like that adding little bits of light it just adds a nice little touch to it now this I could keep working we could work up textures but this is you know this is kind of the the, the initial this is the base this is how I first lay in everything um, and then from there it's really kind of working shadows a little darker a little lighter uh, working in some reflected lights you know maybe we get on here I go a little warmer and a little brighter because it's reflecting some of the light off the ground off the bottom of his jaw right here you know just little things like that maybe we get a little bit of reflected light on the bottom of the cheek bone coming out it gives a little bit of form so I just work up my illustrations in this way maybe a little bit under here how do you decide where to use um, thicker or thinner lines you know that a lot of times thicker is coming forward, thinner is going back, um, and I really I don't even think about it anymore. It's really just about adding interest to the line work. 
Uh, so that's that's really all I'm thinking about when I'm doing that. There we go. So anyway, um, I've got to wrap it up. It's uh, we've gone kind of over, but I, I was really enjoying doing this with you guys. So um, this is you know this is how I do my character stuff, and and we'll be doing more of this. Remember, it's every Thursday here on YouTube on this channel, and then every Tuesday. Or every, every Thursday, I think I said that, Thursday for YouTube and Tuesday over on my Facebook channel. And, um, and we're going to be doing this every week. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And um, until the next time I talk to you, get out there and draw and have fun. This is all meant to be fun. You know, that's that's why we create art. Put beauty back into the world, you know, and, and, uh, and have fun doing it. So I will talk to you. If I don't see you over on Facebook, I'll see you next Thursday. Thanks. And I'm going to say goodbye, right?